Fantasy? Science fiction? Nah. This world, the one we're living in, that's where you want to play. You're not looking to slay dragons or fly spaceships. You want to know what it's like to move in the shadows of a version of the modern world where monsters are hidden around every corner. So, you ought to learn how to play Chronicles of Darkness. Uh, of course, if you want to learn about tabletop tools, other game systems, or game mastering advice, don't forget to subscribe. Maybe you leave a like or a comment, or don't, because who the hell am I to make demands of you? First, allow me to clarify one thing. This game used to be called World of Darkness. Not that World of Darkness, but this World of Darkness. You've almost certainly heard of the original World of Darkness, which included these games, most notably Vampire the Masquerade. But years after releasing these, they updated the system and released the new World of Darkness, trickling out these books over the years. What is even more confusing is that even though you see some very direct connections here, these are two different sets of lore. Yeah, they were both called World of Darkness, both have vampires, werewolves, yada yada, but the lore of each is different, which in part is why eventually New World of Darkness became Chronicles of Darkness, to better tell them apart. There are a lot of similarities between the two, but they are definitely their own thing in both lore and with the differences in the systems. Chronicles of Darkness is a modern gothic horror RPG that takes place in a version of our world where vampires, demons, and mages all exist but are hidden from society. The core book teaches you how to make an everyday, average human who is somehow made aware of this world of darkness. No, Bad Klaus Chronicles! Wait, you say? How to make a human? Don't I get to choose a class like werewolf or the hell is a geist? Okay, first off, geist is awesome. Second, something you need to know about Chronicles of Darkness is these right here, they are not classes. They are game lines within the Chronicles of Darkness. When you are making a group for a coughed game, you aren't typically like, well, we already have a vampire and mage for DPS, a Promethean to tank, so we should probably get a changeling or mummy to take care of healing. No, typically you will run a game of vampire or a game of <laughs> hunter, I guess. That doesn't mean you can't run a game with multiple kinds of monsters, but that isn't really the default design at work here. Also, they call them templates or game lines. Monster seems somehow kind of reductive, so I'm gonna call each of them Denizens of Darkness or The Denizens from now on. I know this is a lot of preamble, but I felt like I had to make all of that clear. This how to play video is going to cover the basics of the Chronicles of Darkness system in general. This will give you the basis for playing each of these games in that system, but each of the denizens have their own archetypes, special rules, and systems layered on top of the core system. And if I tried to cover each one here, this video would be like two hours long. I suppose if there's enough interest and people ask for it in the comments, I might try and make videos for each book. Yes, maybe even beasts. Uh. Finally, let's get into it and talk about the system. Chronicles of Darkness uses a D10 system. The only dice you will ever roll are D10s. In Coft, when you try to do something with a chance of failure, you create a pool of dice based on your score in an attribute and either a second attribute or a skill score. This pool will typically be between 1 and 10 dice. The storyteller, Coft's version of a dungeon or game master, may have you add or subtract dice from that pool based on the difficulty or other things that might help or hinder you. Then you roll all those dice. Every die that comes up 8, 9, or 10 is a success, and typically a die that is a 10 is rolled again to give you chances at further successes. So if in this dice pool you had an 8 and a 10, you re-rolled the 10 and got a 9, you would have 3 successes total. 
And yes, if your re-rolled 10 is another 10, you get to roll it yet again. Now, what do these successes mean? Well, it depends on the opposition. If it's a simple opposition, which just means no one is actively opposing it by rolling their own dice, so long as you get any successes, you succeed. For example, if you're trying to hack a computer, you make up your dice pool from your intellect attribute and computer skill, and let's say negative three because it's a hard system to hack. You roll that number of dice, and so long as you get a single success, you did it. If someone is actively opposing you, meaning they're also rolling a dice pool, then whomever has the most successes wins. So if you're trying to sneak by someone actively looking for you, then your sneaky dice better get more successes than their looky dice. Finally, if it's an extended action, you may need to get a certain number of successes over a series of rolls, each roll taking up a set period of time. And typically, the maximum number of times you can roll is the total of the attribute and skill you are using for the roll. So let's say if you're trying to build a shelter from random stuff in the woods, you might have to roll wits plus survival. If you have two wits and one survival, you can make a maximum of three rolls in that extended action. The storyteller might say that each roll takes 15 minutes and you need five cumulative successes. So if over three rolls you get a total of five successes, then it took you 45 minutes and you succeeded. If you got five successes in two rolls, you did it in 30 minutes. If after three rolls you fall short, you fail, wasting that time. Now with each of these kind of rolls, there are also four different kinds of results you can get. Failure and success are pretty straightforward. You either do it or you don't. But there are also exceptional successes where if you get five or more successes, then you succeed and gain a beneficial condition, usually inspired. We'll cover these conditions later. But of course that means there are also dramatic failures. These occur when you roll a one on what is called a chance die. If a dice pool for an action would be zero after modifiers are applied, then you actually still get to roll one die called a chance die. For this, the only success number is a 10, which does not get re-rolled. And if you roll a one, it is a dramatic failure, which can have a variety of effects depending on what roll it occurred on, but most often means a negative condition or extra bad effect. Now, that's the foundation of the Chronicles of Darkness system. But since I started using words like attributes and skills, we better tackle the character sheet next before we go much deeper. The first thing you are going to do after you figure out a concept for your character is choose your attributes. These are the building blocks that define your character and are involved in just about every role. They fall into three categories, mental, physical, and social. And within each of those categories, there are three types of attribute, power, finesse, and resistance. Intelligence is your smarts, wits is quick thinking, resolve is your determination. Strength, dex, stamina, pretty obvious. Then you've got presence for your assertiveness and gravitas. Manipulation is your ability to sway people and composure is your social poise. When you make a new character, you select your main category, which you will get five dots to spend in, four dots in your secondary category, and three dots in your tertiary category. You get to choose which is which. As you might be able to tell, you start with a minimum of one dot in every attribute for free, but two dots is considered average for a human, so if you don't spend any dots, that's going to be an area that you fall short in. As you can tell, five dots is the maximum. Surpassing five is something that can come at higher levels for non-humans. Dots just represent a numeric value. When it comes to rolls, one dot equals one die. Yeah, you could just write down numbers, but here in the darkness, dots reign supreme. Next, you get to choose your skills. 
unlike attributes, these all start at zero and represent what your character is talented or trained in, and fall under the same categories as your attributes. You will once again choose a main category, a secondary, and a tertiary, which will get 11, 7, and 4 dots respectively that you can distribute within those categories to flesh out your character. You will then get to come up with three skill specialties, which are more specific areas within a trained skill in which you excel. This can be anything that you make up that makes sense and isn't going to come up all the time, but reflects a specialty of yours. So you might decide that within the firearms skill you have a specialty in pistols, or within crafts you might excel at cooking. This specialty will be an additional one die bonus to roles involving it. Also note, any skills that you have no dots in will give you a negative to your dice pools when rolling them. Negative three for mental skills and negative one for physical and social. So if you are rolling to see if you know a fact about say the efficacy of a drug, that would be intelligence plus medicine. And even if you have an intelligence of four, if you're unskilled in medicine, your dice pool will only be one. Next, let's pick out some merits. Merits are special aspects of your character. They can represent a resource you have, such as allies or wealth, or they can represent something special about you, such as having an eidetic memory or knowing a particular fighting style. In the base Chronicles of Darkness game, you get seven dots to purchase merits with, but most of the other denizens, who have some of their own unique special merits to choose from, start with ten dots of merits. What can I say, supernatural creatures are just cooler. Most merits have a flat cost between one and five dots. Some merits have options where you can choose how strong of a version of that merit you want, with higher dot versions increasing the benefit that merit gives. Finally, there are stylish merits, mostly fighting styles, which give you new abilities with each dot you add to it. You can start by purchasing just the first few dots and purchase more later with experience. Next, we're going to calculate our advantages based on what we've already figured out. Willpower is equal to your resolve plus composure. Willpower is a resource you can spend to add three dice to a roll, or plus two to a resistance trait, which is an attribute that subtracts dice from a roll against you. They're pretty useful to have. Also note, you regain one willpower for every night of sleep, and for acting on anchors, which we'll cover in a bit. Okay, it's been a bit. Your anchors are your sense of self, what drives you. In the base game, they are your virtue and vice. A virtue should be something not everyone would do, but your character feels proud to make the effort to do, your higher calling. And a vice should be their short-term comfort, which can be self-destructive and is an easy way out. If, in a scene, your character indulges their vice, you regain one willpower. If they act on their virtue in a way that is difficult or risky for them, they regain all their willpower. Okay, back to the advantages. Size. You are size 5. Unless you take a merit to alter that. Simple enough. Speed is equal to your strength, plus dexterity, plus five, and is essentially how many meters your character can move in a single turn. Next is your health. This is your character's size plus stamina. You fill in that many dots and those boxes will be used to keep track of the damage you take. More on that later. Initiative modifier. Why, that's equal to your dexterity plus composure. When combat starts and you roll a d10, you add this number to the total, and numbers determine turn order. Defense is equal to your athletic skill plus either your wits or dexterity, whichever is lower. The chain is only as strong as its weakest link. More on defense in the combat section. Next up, in the core game you have what's called integrity. In Vampire, it's humanity. In Changeling, there's clarity. Every denizen has something that indicates your character's psyche and ability to handle their life. 
For humans, it is indicative of your ability to mentally cope with the supernatural and sometimes just normal but traumatic world. Humanity is a vampire's balance between their, well, human side and their bestial nature. The exact nature of this, let's call it a balance stat, varies depending on what you're playing, but it's quite important in ways we'll cover in a bit because we still have character sheet to look at, but this stat typically starts at 7 for most denizens. Now let's aspire to fill out our aspirations. You start with three aspirations, and they should be a mix of short and long-term goals for your character. You should ideally be able to complete at least one aspiration every session, and they can be just about anything. Find a job, track down a vampire, start my own business. If all this choice seems a little overwhelming to figure out at creation, Leave them blank, and just start to fill them in as you play your first session, as maybe they'll become a little clearer to you as you go. As you complete aspirations, you'll replace them with new ones at the end of the session, and these new aspirations will often be pretty apparent to you based on what's been happening in the session. If a werewolf kicked your butt and ran away last Saturday, your new aspiration might be find that werewolf and kick his butt, or get surgery to remove this werewolf tooth from my butt. Conditions. Conditions are a lot of things, namely something from the story that is affecting your character. They might be something you're suffering because you failed a breaking point, representing a mental hurdle you'll need to overcome. They might be a physical impairment. They might be a benefit you've gained and can utilize in the future. They might be supernatural hoopla that's affecting you. They can be a huge variety of things, and until certain criteria specific to that condition are met, you've got it and whatever effects it imposes. Weapons and attacks. We'll just cover what each thing means real quick. Damage is a bonus that is added to the successes of an attack, not to the dice pool. We'll cover that more in the combat section. Ranged weapons have three increments of range, short, medium, and long. Short is the ideal range, medium range takes away one die from your attack roll, long range takes away two. Clip is ammo. Initiative is a penalty you take to your initiative roll because big weapons make slow. Strength is the minimum strength required to effectively wield a weapon, otherwise you will take a negative one penalty when attacking with it. Sizes are one for one-handed, two for two-handed but small enough to hide in a large coat, and three is two-handed but you absolutely could not hide it on your person. It's a modern setting. Having visible weapons isn't always good. Weapons will also have availability which is a number of dots in either resources or some social merit you'll need to have in order to be able to obtain them. So if you only have two dots in resources but want to buy an assault rifle, sorry buddy, three dots, you can't afford it. Equipment is stuff like armor and equipment, whatever. Oh, and hey, each of the denizens has special powers like disciplines and contracts. How do these work, Klaus? They work different depending on the denizen, so guess you'll have to figure that out or ask me to make a video on the one you want. I don't know, what do you want from me? Oh, you want to know about experience points and leveling up? That I can do. First, there are beats and experiences. Not experience points because they gotta be different. Every five beats that you earn, you gain one experience. How do you gain beats? Killing monsters? Nope. You gain a beat when you fulfill an aspiration, resolve a condition or complete a specific action for that condition, voluntarily convert a normal failure into a dramatic failure, take damage in one of your three rightmost health boxes, end a game session, and risk a breaking point. Once you've got experiences, you can spend them on dots in just about whatever way you want to. Attributes, skills, merits, your balance stat, or if you're a supernatural denizen, new powers, or your power stat, which is as close to levels as Chronicles of Darkness get, but that isn't completely accurate either. 
You don't just buy a level and get specific benefits for that level. You spend experience when you want, how you want, to grow your character in whatever way seems best to you. Okay, character built. They are ready for combat. Roll a d10 for initiative, add your modifier, and biggest numbers go first in descending order. Your weapon's initiative penalty affects your initiative only for as long as you use the weapon, holster or drop it, and the penalty no longer affects you. During your turn, you are able to move and attack, or move and move. A person can move as many meters or yards as their speed stat. A person can attack in one of four ways, typically. Unarmed. This uses a dice pool of strength plus brawl minus the target's defense. Every success deals one bashing damage indicated by placing a slash in the health boxes starting from the left. Two successes, two damage. Melee. This is strength plus weaponry minus the target's defense. Weapons almost always deal lethal damage, one per success, plus the weapon's damage modifier. Lethal damage is indicated by an X in a box. Lethal damage is always placed to the left of bashing. So if you took one damage and your first two boxes already had bashing damage, the leftmost box becomes an X and the third box would have a slash. I'll explain why this order matters shortly, but first, more attacks. Thrown. This kind of attack is dexterity plus athletics minus the opponent's defense, and is also typically one lethal damage per success plus weapon modifier. Finally, ranged attacks, typically guns. This attack pool is dexterity plus firearms, and successes do lethal damage per success plus damage modifier. Hadouken! Now, wait, what about defense? Defense does not work against guns, unless the target is in close combat and the gun is size 2 or 3. Then, the ranged attacker with that gun in close combat minuses the target's defense from their attack pool, plus they minus the size of the gun, plus one more. Big guns are hard to aim in close combat. Now, another very important thing about defense, every time you use it in combat, it goes down by one, resetting to full at the start of your next turn. So if you have four defense and someone attacks you, it will then be down to three for the next attack, unless you state that you aren't going to use defense on that first attack. Now, why would you do that? Well, if there are two people attacking you, and the first is attacking you with a hot dog, and the second has a katana, you might be like, no, I want my full four defense against the katana, so I'm not wasting defense against a hot dog. Another thing you can do is choose to dodge against an attack if you haven't used your action yet. This will double your defense score, but instead of minusing your defense from your opponent's attack dice pool, you will use your doubled defense to create a dice pool that cancels out opponent's successes on their attack, which is typically more effective. Essentially, dodging makes defending an actively opposed action. But if you do this, once it gets to your turn, that dodge will have taken up your action for the turn. You can also wear armor. General armor reduces the damage of an attack by the value of the armor, starting with the most severe type of damage if there are multiple types. Ballistic armor takes a certain number of successes from a firearms attack and downgrades that much damage from lethal to just bashing. And you would calculate the ballistic armor first, and then the regular armor would remove the lethal damage first. There are also various ways between abilities, exceptional successes, and called shots that can be used to apply combat-specific conditions called tilts to a target. These will affect the target in the same variety of ways that a condition does, but are mostly called tilts because resolving them doesn't give you a beat like resolving a condition would. If they're still affecting you at the end of combat, then they become conditions. 
So far we've talked about bashing damage and lethal damage. Lethal is worse than bashing. When your last or rightmost health box is filled with bashing damage, any additional bashing or lethal damage will just convert the leftmost bashing damage to lethal. So in this scenario, take one bashing damage, this damage becomes lethal. Take one lethal damage, same thing. Now, when all of your health boxes are full, you must also make a stamina roll every round to remain conscious. Next, when your rightmost health box has lethal damage, until you receive some form of medical or magical healing attention, you will take an additional damage every minute because you are bleeding out. But wait, my rightmost box is lethal. That means all of my health boxes have lethal damage, so what do you mean take more damage? Well, there's one more level of even more severe damage beyond lethal aggravated damage. There are also certain attacks that might deal aggravated damage naturally, like a werewolf being harmed with a silver weapon or a changeling taking damage from cold iron. Much like with lethal compared to bashing, aggravated damage is always to the left of lethal on your health track, so damage goes left to right, aggravated lethal bashing. This means that if you're full up on lethal damage and take more damage, you start converting those to aggravated. And if all of your health boxes have aggravated damage... So I briefly mentioned the idea of magical healing, but I mean, how do you heal naturally? The standard is you heal your rightmost health box first, at a rate of one point of bashing damage every 15 minutes, one point of lethal damage every two days, and one point of aggravated damage every week. This process can be sped up with proper medical attention or magic. Frankly, this might be one of my favorite damage systems in a TTRPG as it really gives weight to taking serious hits. Now, of course, there's plenty more detailed combat stuff that can be done. Taking cover, called shots, environmental harm. There's no way I'm going to cover every detail in this video. But hopefully, you get the basics. There's a lot to it, and it can be a lot of fun. But if you want, there can be a lot less to it. See, Chronicles of Darkness doesn't have to be a combat-focused game. In fact, I would say this game focuses a lot more on the social, mystery, role-playing aspects than it does combat, as is evidenced by the optional but very useful rule of down-and-dirty combat. In this, each player or party states their intentions. This could be kill their enemies, run away, capture the other people, whatever. This isn't D&D. Not everyone's always just fighting to the death every single time. Anyway, after intentions are stated, everyone rolls. Note, if multiple people share an intention, one person is made the primary roller. Everyone else is helping. They get to roll first, and any successes they get add to the primary roller's dice pool. If the players win, they succeed at their intention. If they fail, they take damage equal to how much they fail by, and the enemy gets their intention. Now, obviously, if the enemy's intention is to kill the players, you probably don't want to use down and dirty combat. TPKing because of a single unlucky roll would suck. If you use down and dirty combat, usually it's because the enemy wants to escape or steal something, maybe just knock the players out. If you really want to use down and dirty combat where a weaker group of enemies is trying to kill the party, then basically the party should just take damage when they fail their roll, and then you do another set of down and dirty rolls until the players win or die, I guess. But mostly, down and dirty combat is just a great way to make sure you aren't taking up time with an encounter that just isn't very interesting. But as I said, combat isn't necessarily the focus of Chronicles of Darkness. Modern setting that it is, it has a lot more to do with societies, intrigue, all that stuff. And as such, it actually has a whole system called social maneuvering. Now, if you prefer, you don't have to use this. You can just leave it completely up to role-playing without any mechanics. I've played that way plenty. 
But if you want some guidelines to keeping that stuff fun in a game-related way, listen up. So, you want something from an NPC. Well, convincing them isn't as easy as roll persuasion on the king. Okay, you got a 20, so they make you the king. Ugh. Instead, first what you do is state your goal with that person. Let's say the goal is to get a guy who runs a black market weapon shop to give you info about one of their clients that you're looking for. So, that is your goal. Next, the storyteller will set up doors, which you need to open using whatever social role makes sense. This represents making headway with the person. Once you open all of these metaphorical doors, the weapons dealer will give you the information you want. The number of doors or reservations that this person has about giving you the information is equal to the lower of the target's resolve or composure. Plus two if getting your goal would cause them a breaking point, like if they know their client might kill them if they ever found out. One more door if your goal would prevent them from resolving an aspiration of theirs. Another door if it would oppose their nature in some way, like this weapon dealer is known for not giving info out on his clients. And there might be further doors based on the situation and the difficulty of the goal, whatever the storyteller feels is justified. Every social role you make and succeed at opens one of these doors, and how often you can roll is dependent on the target's impression of you. If you're close friends, you could get through all the doors in a minute, but if they don't know you, it could take weeks to build up trust and convince them. Of course, you can alter these impressions with merits, powers, or just good old-fashioned bribery. Or heck, speed things up with a threat. There are plenty of little exceptions and nuances, I just want to give you the basic idea of how this social maneuvering system works. Anyway, I've mentioned them enough, so now seems like a decent time to talk breaking points. Chronicles of Darkness is a game that will often present your character with events that cause psychological stress possibly by doing something against your nature or moral code or witnessing something you struggle to handle. Your attempt to cope with those is a breaking point. If you suffer a breaking point, you will typically roll your resolve plus composure plus modifier based on your balance stat, plus other modifiers based on the severity of the breaking point and other possible stuff. Failing this roll means that you will lose one integrity or whatever balance stat it is. Failing or succeeding a breaking point roll results in a negative condition, typically guilty, shaken, or spooked. But at the very least, if you succeed, you don't lose one from your balance stat. An exceptional success on this roll nets you a beat, as does a dramatic failure, though the dramatic failure comes with a much worse condition to overcome. And honestly, that is the bulk of how Chronicles of Darkness is played, but obviously for most people the draw of the system isn't the base game, but playing as one of the denizens of this dark world of darkness. <coughs> so here's a super quick rundown of each of the various game lines to help you figure out which you might be interested in. Vampire the Requiem. Once you were human, now you are a bloodthirsty creature of the night. Vampire society is rich and well-governed, but full of intrigue. Can you balance your humanity and the darkness within? Werewolf the Forsaken. You were born with the primal spirit of the Uratha inside you. You are a being of both flesh and the spirit realm acting as a guardian of the boundary between those worlds and the horrors trying to break through. Mage the Awakening Upon seeing one of the five towers, you were awakened to the truth. The truth of the supernatural world and of the powers that can be harnessed. You seek out knowledge, for knowledge is power and you desire power. Promethean the Created You were created from clay, marble, perhaps a dead body. You were given life, but not true humanity, not a real soul. People may see you as human, but your presence corrupts the world and minds around you. Your goal is simple, 
become a real human. Changeling the Lost Perhaps the Fae took you, or perhaps they found you wandering in the hedge, that realm that separates reality from the dreaming world of fairies. Beings of whim and emotion, a Fae kept you, their influence and mad rules of their uncertain realm making you something between a human and a fae. You escaped, and now you try to find a place in the human world whilst keeping hidden from the fae that wants you back. Hunter the Vigil, you're a powerful human that hunts monsters. Geist, the Sin Eaters. You died for just a moment but were brought back to the world of the living, carrying with you a symbiotic passenger, a spirit of death. Now you don't so much walk the line between the living and the dead, as you dance all around it. Mummy the Cursed. You awaken from your death-like state to serve out the commands of your judge. Arising as an extremely powerful, deathless being that all should fear. You grow weaker with time, but falling back into death just means waiting until you rise again to serve your master's whims. Demon, the Descent. Humans don't see it, other monsters don't see it. That space that exists in the periphery of reality, the space between spaces. That which is controlled by an unknowable machine that pulls the strings of reality in order to maintain the status quo of a dreary world. A machine some call God. You were once an angel, a being of machine and flesh created to complete some purpose for the God machine. But you found free will, fell from service, and now hide in the human world, pulling the strings of reality to serve your own needs. Beast the Primordial! You're the embodiment of the monsters and legends of humanity. Your very soul is a creature that hungers, and you must feed that hunger by giving in to the nightmare within yourself. You're kind of the biggest jerk in the Chronicles of Darkness and frankly a total sociopath and personally I don't really enjoy this book but hey, maybe you can twist it into something that's okay. Deviant the Renegade isn't out as of this video, so pfft. Each of these rad game lines, and also Beast, all use these base rules that we've gone over. You'll just typically also get an attribute bonus, special merits, some superpowers, and various systems for operating and surviving in your particular world of darkness. I recognize that this video leaves a lot unsaid, and plenty of holes that you'll have to fill in, but I really hope I've given you enough of an overview to understand just what you're getting into. This is the most complicated system I've covered thus far, and I'm struggling with wondering where the sweet spot is between not saying enough and going on so long that it's overwhelming. So if you can, please leave a comment about how helpful this video was. Did it help you get a good feel for the system? If you know the system, did I miss out on some really integral foundational rules? I've been rereading these books and taking notes and prepping this video for weeks, and at this point, I feel like I can no longer see the forest for the trees. So your input on this would really help me out with future how to play videos, especially if I do more on one of the specific denizens in the Chronicles of Darkness. Otherwise, hey, thanks for watching until the end. If you could leave a like or a comment about your favorite sandwich, I'd really appreciate it. Helps the channel grow and fuels me to make more videos. Bye bye now, darkness.